2 Peter chapter number 1. That'll be closer to the end of your Bible, 2 Peter chapter number 1. Most of you know that uh, just a few weeks ago we finished the book of 1 Peter. In fact, we took 36 messages to look at that. And at the end of that, I began to pray, Lord, where's next? And I believe the Lord would have us just continue to the very next book, and that would be 2 Peter. So this morning we're going to look at the first four verses. I know that we have a little less time than normal. I recognize that. I think these updates on people's health and these uh, votes were important. But uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'd like us to uh, read together verse 1 through 4. Again, 2 Peter chapter 1, if we could begin in verse number 1, reading together, reading out loud all the way through the end of verse 4. Let's start there in verse number 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's pray. Father, again, we do thank you after having missed several weeks of church that we can be back in church. I know the world doesn't think much of this, don't think it's that important, but God, for we who are so used to gathering, when we couldn't do it, we missed it. And now we rejoice that we can be back. And now, Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we begin a new study. Study this book of Second Peter. Help us, Lord, to get started on the right step to understand what it is that is the prevailing theme of this book. And then, Lord, I pray to open our eyes to some truths that are given, even in these four verses. I pray, Lord, you'd help me. Give me your energy. Give my voice the strength that it needs. I don't want it to be uh, annoying. Help us speak to our hearts, not just our heads, but our hearts. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you, uh, if you uh, kind of remember when we were in 1 Peter, that whole theme of 1 Peter was Christian suffering. And Peter was trying to encourage those that uh, he was writing to that were indeed suffering for their Savior. As we look through that book of 1 Peter, we, uh, we reminded he was trying to encourage them. 1 Peter was written by Peter. Second Peter was written also by Peter. Now, that seems to be rather an odd thing to say, doesn't it? I mean, preacher, isn't that kind of obvious? You'd be surprised how many take issue with saying that Peter wrote Second Peter. Pastor, how can we be sure? Look there at Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, too. And so it's very clear that Peter wrote 2 Peter. Not only that, but look there, if you would, in chapter 3 and verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, we read this second epistle. Beloved, now I write unto you. And so again, uh, it's written by Peter. It's written by Peter. Not only is that common between First and Second Peter, the second thing that's common is who it's written to. Back up there, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter number 1. Let's remind ourselves who 1 Peter was written to. The Bible says chapter 1, 1 Peter 1 and verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. I know that's a long thing to read. First Peter was written to believers, written to those that have been washed in the blood of Christ. Okay, now look again at Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, 
to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm trying to first give you similarities. First Peter and Second Peter were both written by Peter. First Peter and Second Peter were both written to believers. Well, say, Pastor, if they were both written by the same man, if they were both written to the same people, are the themes going to be the same? No, that's where the difference comes. Again, 1 Peter was written to uh, encourage those that were suffering for their faith. 2 Peter, on the other hand, is written to those who could be seduced away from their faith. A very different theme. In 1 Peter, he describes Satan as an old lion. In 2 Peter, he describes Satan as an old liar. Again, in 1 Peter, he warns about the attacks that Christians will get from without. But in 2 Peter, he's warning attacks that Christians will get from within. And so they're not the same. They're very different. In 1 Peter, he had a burden to comfort those believers that were going through the fire. In 2 Peter, he is trying to caution believers who are playing with the fire. And so we certainly would understand that uh, in our day and age, there are Christians that are facing both of that. There are some that are discouraged. They're discouraged but because of the opposition that comes for being a Christian. But we also know that there are Christians that are under attack. And this time it's not attacked by the world, but this time it's influences even within their church that are trying to get them to compromise. Preacher, what is it specifically that we're looking at here this morning? In the first four verses of 2 Peter 1, we found a word that Peter used two times. And it's really the theme of these first four verses. Look there in 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Notice that word precious. And then look at verse number 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and Precious promises. Do you know what these first four verses are mainly talking about? It's talking about some things that ought to be precious to every believer. In fact, that's my title this morning. Some things that ought to be precious to every believer. Now, maybe you use that word precious about everything. Maybe you talk about your grandchildren being precious. Maybe you talk about your car being precious. Pastor Don Green who is my wife's pastor now for many years. And every time we would meet him, and it wasn't very often, once a year, every two years, he'd say, Robert, you are precious to me. Now, honestly, I think he says that about everybody on his prayer list, and it takes him four hours to get through his prayer list. But precious is something that you hold dear. Precious is something that has a great value. And what we're seeing here in these opening four verses is we're finding some things that Peter says that every Christian ought to hold as precious. Truth is, Peter used that word precious five times in 1 Peter. And then we've already seen here in 2 Peter, he uses it two times. I think all of us have things that are precious. Maybe Maybe for you it's a piece of jewelry, maybe it's a ring, a necklace. Maybe for you it's your vehicle. Maybe for you it's your house. Maybe it's people. I think if you're married, your husband or wife ought to be precious. I think your children ought to be precious. And if you have grandchildren, that's when you even forget about the children. Ben is cashing in on the last months left, where I'll still remember I have a son, because there's a grandbaby on the way. So certainly things are precious. People are precious. 
You know what you normally do with precious things? You kind of lock them up, keep them safe. I'm told that if you go to uh, museums, and museums often they uh, keep things that are precious. If you ever had a chance to go to Washington and the Smithsonian Institute, in that place there is a natural history museum. And in there you can go to a particular room and you can see what they call the Hope Diamond. And uh, you're allowed to go there, but you have to look through a big, thick piece of glass. And in behind there is what is called the Hope Diamond. And it's considered to be priceless. And they have guards and security. And, you know, people wait in a long line just for a few moments, and then someone kind of budges them out. And, and why all that protection? Because so many times those things that are the most precious to us we have to guard them. We have to keep them from others getting too close. But could I say to you that Peter is going to give us a short list here in these four, first four verses of some things that every Christian ought to hold as precious. Truthfully, there are things that this world holds. In time, they'll all pass away. Do you know that uh, sometimes uh, people uh, consider other people, uh, someone famous, someone that's achieved something, and they think they're precious, well, one day they'll pass away. But you know, these things, if you and I can claim these things, they'll bring eternal value. Let me get quickly into our list. Look there in 2 Peter chapter 1. Again, we're looking at some things that ought to be precious to every believer. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Very first thing that we find here that he uses this word precious is connected to faith. In our Bible, when we use that word faith, it means one of two. Faith sometimes means trust. Faith means confidence. Uh, if I did this, I would be showing you that I have an element of faith. And so sometimes faith is your trust in. But you know the other times, in fact, for by grace are you saved through faith. We know Hebrews 11 says faith is the substance of things hoped for. So that's that trust. But you know there's other times where that word faith is talking about the body of all that we believe. And, and we would claim to have the Christian faith. There in Jude in verse 3, Jude said that we're to earnestly contend for the faith. And so part of our Christian faith is that there's a trinity. We believe that. We believe that all this began by the creative hand of God. We believe that our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary to pay for our sins. We believe in a perfect Bible. We believe that one day, if you trust Christ as your Savior, at that moment, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell. We believe that there is a judgment to come. We believe in a rapture. All of those things are part of our Christian faith. And would you notice again in verse number one, the very first thing that Peter says that ought to be precious to every believer, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. You know, as Peter wrote to the believers in the first century, he reminded them of the faith that they embraced. And you say, well, preacher, why would that be so important? Why would that be such a big deal? Because not everybody holds that faith. You know it's true how, how much effort we put into to get the gospel out into our city. And it was gospel tracts, it's holding up scripture signs. When God opens opportunity, it's talking to people one-on-one. -on -one. And you know, if you're a Christian, you know that this Christian faith that you possess, not everybody possesses it. The Lord Jesus Christ that's special to you, he's not special to all. 
And while we are anxious to get the gospel into the hearts of lost people, there's many lost people that don't want it. They don't care for it. And so I say that many people deny that there's a God. They deny that he has a son, Jesus. They deny a trinity. They deny it all began with creation. And for you that work in this world, so many rub shoulders with people that think nothing of Christ and nothing of salvation. They've never opened up a Bible, and honestly, they don't really care to. And so you know what Peter is saying, first of all? If you can say, I'm a Christian, if you can say, I've trusted God, if you can say, I'm on my way to heaven, if you can say those things, he said, that ought to be precious to you. And I know that there are many here this morning that, uh, that you can say that. But you know, not all can. Sometimes, humanly speaking, we put people on different levels. Maybe we put Paul up there and Peter up there. You know, maybe we put a Charles Spurgeon, a George Mueller, a David Livingston, men that we think have accomplished great things. Sometimes we put people on levels. And then maybe when we get to reading about a Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, maybe they're not quite as high. And you know, sometimes in our zeal, if you would, we put people on different levels. But you know what? When it comes to Christians, the Bible says theirs is the same Christian faith. And you might not be a Charles Spurgeon, I might not be a David Livingston, but you know, I can embrace that same precious Christian faith that they have. Look again at verse number one. Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. And so what a blessing, again, if you're taking notes and things that ought to be precious to every believer, very first thing is your genuine Christian faith. When we talk to people and ask them, do you know for sure? If you died, you'd go to heaven. How many say, I don't think anyone can know? Well, you know what that tells you? They don't know. But if you're saved, you know. And it's precious. It's precious to know that we have trusted Christ as our Savior. And isn't it wonderful to meet other Christians? You might never have met them before. If you've done some traveling and maybe you used to do more than you do now, but you know, Sunday rolls around or midweek service time rolls around. And if you're like our family, you open up a telephone book, whatever that is now. And you look for a church in your area. And you go in for the very first time, you meet people you've never met before. And there is just that bond that you have with them as you sing those same songs, open up the scriptures. Preacher, what is that bond? That bond is this like precious faith. I wonder, is it precious to you? Could it be that you've been saved so long you've taken it for granted? Not everybody has it. I quickly give you a second thing. Second thing that ought to be precious is also found in verse number one. Second thing we read there, 2 Peter 1, 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now to understand the second precious thing, we have to be reminded what Peter wrote when he started his first letter. So keep 2 Peter 1 verse 1 and turn, if you would, to 1 Peter 1 and verse 1. Now, I didn't give you this detail, but I should have. If you remember when we were going through 1 Peter, the theme, of course, Christian suffering. But 1 Peter, if you would, uh, was written in 60 A.D. If you have notes on the top of 2 Peter, it was written in 66 A.D. So there are six years of time that's passed between 1 Peter and 2 Peter. There's time that's passed. Therefore, we ought to see some changes in what Peter writes, indicating changes in Peter himself in those six years. Well, look again at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. We read there, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing wrong with that statement. He identifies himself as Peter. 
He identifies himself as an apostle, one that the Lord had chosen specifically to get out the gospel. But then keep that while you turn back to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter. Well, he didn't give that word Simon in the first letter. He writes, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. There's two changes that we find between 1 Peter and 2 Peter. The first one is the name. Do you know Simon is the name that he was given when he was first born? His parents gave him that name. Do you know the name Simon means shifting sand? It reminded him all of his life about his weaknesses, about his frailties, about his human deficiencies. We know that the name Peter, that name Peter means a rock. That name Peter means a stone. And that name Peter is a name that our Lord gave him there in John chapter number 1 when our Lord met him. And throughout Peter's life, whenever it seems that he was making some decisions that just were a little less spiritual, if I could say it, Simon's name is used. But when he makes decisions that are closer to God's will, a Peter is used. And so the first thing we notice is a different in names. But the second thing we notice as we look here is a different in rank. Look again, 1 Peter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says, Peter, an apostle. And so he quickly identified to those that he was writing, identified his rank or his position. He said, I'm an apostle. I'm chosen of God. I've been picked by him for a particular deed, a particular assignment. And yet again, look at 2 Peter chapter 1. He says, Simon Peter, a servant. Say, preacher, I, I don't quite understand what's the second thing that's precious. Do you know in those six years, Peter had to remind himself that he was still fighting that old flesh. That he hadn't got complete victory of it yet. That's why I mentioned the name Simon. But the second thing that we notice, that even ahead of that title, apostle, Peter put that word servant. And he reminded himself and reminded all those that were reading this little letter. He said, yes, it's true that I'm still an apostle. It's true that God still has a, has a position that he has given me. But he said, I have realized the longer that I've been saved, that as much as the position, it's just as important, if not even more, that I am somehow busy in service for my Lord. And you know what this world says if you are going to get higher in the estimation of people? then you just have to learn to walk over people. That's this world's philosophy. If you know the Bible estimation, if you want to go higher, then you have to make yourself lower. And that's exactly what Peter is doing. And so second thing that is precious that we find here in 2 Peter chapter 1, if you're taking notes, second thing that ought to be precious to every believer is your growth in Jesus Christ. Say, Pastor, I've been saved for 10 years. Preacher, I've been saved for 15 and for 20 years. Pastor, I've held in that time plenty of offices. I've had plenty of tasks and wore plenty of badges and done plenty of things. You know, an uh, indication of growth in your Christian life is not uh, waiving all the accomplishments that you have done. It's talking about what you are doing. And I wonder, are you still looking for some kind of service that you can do. And here, Peter, he, he wasn't embarrassed at all with calling himself a servant. Because I believe that Peter was convinced that being a servant was an indication that he was still growing. You know, people sometimes, all they begin to talk about is their past, what they used to do, what they used to accomplish what they one time achieved. 
But if you notice there again, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1, notice the tense of the statement that he is making Simon Peter as servant, present tense. And an apostle again, I say to you, you and I know that every person that gets saved, they're eternally secure for heaven. But you know it's true that not every person that's saved is serving. Not every person that's saved is looking for some way that they can be a faithful servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here Peter says, if you are growing in your Christian life, that's precious. Folks, you don't want to be stagnant. You're either going forward or you're sliding back. And I say to you in this list of things that ought to be precious, first is your genuine Christian faith. Second is your growth in Jesus Christ. Quickly, let me give you a third thing. Look there in verse number two. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. Could you write this down? The third thing that ought to be precious is God's grace and God's peace in our lives. God's grace and God's peace in our lives. Pastor, what's grace? Grace is God's supernatural strength. Grace is God's supernatural help. That's grace. What's peace? Peace is a calm in every situation. Have you not had people tell you, and maybe they've told you recently, I don't know how you can keep a smile on your face with what's happening in your life. I don't know how you have a joy in your heart. I don't know how you're able to sing these songs with what you're facing. And you know the only way that a Christian can face these things is verse 2. Look again at verse 2. Grace and peace. But notice what he says. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So God wants to give us grace. God wants to give us peace. And when God gives it in our situation, this world is going to say, how do you do it? What's the secret? I had a Christian woman many, years, many, many years ago said this to my wife and I. I don't know how you do it. You must be on drugs. <laughs> we said it's called Flintstones. That's the drug. You know what? It's not drugs. It's not therapy. It's grace. And here he says grace and peace be multiplied. You know, it's true, this world doesn't have that grace. They don't have that peace. When I spoke with Luigi yesterday, I asked him, what were you thinking when you were in that prison cell? He said, I was thinking God's in charge. You know, that's grace. And whatever it is that you're looking at right now, when this world says, how do you do it? You don't know how it's going to turn out. How do you, how do, you do it? You know, the answer is grace. The answer is peace, Pastor. I don't have that grace. Preacher, I don't have that peace. I'm afraid my, my heart is torn up and my mind is 20 directions. How do I get that growing grace? He gives us the answer in verse 2. 2 Peter 1 and verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You've heard me say this so many times. But you know the reason that we read the scriptures is so we can learn about God, how he works, how he operates, what he's done in the life of others, and the more knowledge that we have of our God, the more knowledge that we have of Jesus Christ, and if we're not just reading for the sake of reading, if we stand back and say, wow, the Lord helped him in that place. God strengthened that woman. The more knowledge that we have of how our God and our Savior works, that knowledge gives us grace. 
That knowledge gives us peace. In fact, if you missed it in verse 2, he repeats it in verse 3. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. And again, uh, you know, the more that you know the Lord, the more you'll know you can trust him. And you say, Pastor, I just heard news that, and so what are you going to do? Trust the Lord. <laughs> again, I... Oh, it's, it's fresh in my mind talking to Luigi. I said, what if campus casing does not work out? What if that door is already shut? And he said, then God has another door. And I just kind of, I thought, what a blessing. That God's given him that kind of grace. And that kind of peace. You know, we need to spend time with God to know God more. We need to spend time in his word to learn how he's worked in the past because it'll give us grace. And Peter says there in verse 2 and 3, if you have that kind of grace, that's precious. If you are enjoying that kind of peace, that's precious. Listen, you could have a hundred people try to encourage you. It won't do what this book will do to encourage you. You could have 100 people call you, and as, as people of the same church family, we need to do all that and more. But people will not be able to give you grace. Only God can. People will not give you peace. God can. I give you the last thing this morning. Look there in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Again, we're looking at some things that will be precious to every believer First thing, your genuine Christian faith. If you're saved, that's precious. Second thing is your growth in Jesus Christ. If you are further along as a Christian, that's precious. Third thing, God's grace and peace in your lives. But I gave you the last one again, 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. We read there, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. We could spend uh, 10 messages on that one. You know what he's saying here, finally, in closing? He's saying when you got saved, God made some promises to you. And if you can claim these things, things that this world cannot, and they couldn't buy them with all the silver and gold, that's precious. Lastly, we see fourth thing that ought to be precious to every believer is God's great and precious promises. You know, if you're saved, you've been given all kinds of promises. He used the word great because of the wonder of these. He used the word exceeding because of the size of these. And he used the word precious because of the value that they were. Isn't it true? The devil tries to say to Christians, you're missing out on the best. The devil tries to say to a lost person that's being witnessed to, you don't want this Christianity stuff. You know all that you're going to miss in this world if you get saved. You know what he said in verse number four? It's only when you get saved that you can claim these things. This world is chasing after a dream and they'll never ever get it. And at the end of their life, they'll realize how empty the promises that this world is. But the moment that you got saved, you got these. Let me give you quickly a reminder. First of all, the promise of salvation. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're saved, you have the promise of salvation. You can say, I know that I'm saved. How few can say that? That's a great and precious promise. Well, the promise of eternal life. I know that some are still wondering. But you know, the Bible makes it very clear. He that hath the Son hath life. 1 John 5, 13, These things have written unto you to believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's a great and precious promise. Think of this one, eternal security. You know, Paul wrote this and 
2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. Listen, folks, I'm not able to keep me saved, but he's able. What a promise. Uh, quickly, I think of the fourth promise, the indwelling Holy Spirit. You know, you and I don't have the sense to continuously walk the right life. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to make errors. But the moment that you got saved, the Holy Spirit came and moved inside. Paul said, Romans 8 9, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And so we can trust that the Spirit of God will guide us. You say, preacher, I have a decision to make in these next days. Have you asked the Spirit of God to direct you? Have you asked Him to show you? You say, preacher, I have, but I haven't got an answer. Then keep waiting. I'm saying it's a great promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Right, here's a great promise that heaven is waiting for you. Listen, already right now, the Lord up there in glory has a place. If you're saved with your name on it, in my Father's house are many mansions, Jesus said, if we're not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. What a promise. I think of the promise that the Lord is going to return to take us home. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know, we have a promise when we get there of a glorified body. Isn't it true the older that we get? It just doesn't seem to work like it used to. It was funny that uh, it, just a week ago, my mind said, this is how to do it. But this body just wouldn't cooperate. Folks, that's what's happening to this flesh. When we get to heaven, it's not the same. It's a glorified body. What a promise. I think of the promise of the confidence that God is in control. I think of that, Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. How about the promise of strength to overcome any temptation? How about the promise of answered prayer? Do you know every one of those promises we have? And for someone not saved in this world, what they wouldn't give to know that there is someone that can always guide them to make the right choice, but they don't have that. Folks, we have it. All of those are present promises. Again, you're in 2 Peter, look at verse 1, chapter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us, present tense, exceeding great and precious promises. Well, Pastor, why is it so important that we embrace all these promises. Look at the very end of verse 4. That by these, that's the promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Do you know as we think on these promises, it directs our mind God's way to please the Lord, to want more of God, how important it is. They're precious. And you know, maybe, just maybe, whether it's someone here or someone listening to this message, maybe you say, preacher, I'm not a Christian, but I'll take care of that someday. I know someone in my family is saved. They want me to get saved. But I've got lots of time. You probably have less time than you think. I think if baseball is of any importance to you, you would recognize the name Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth is considered to be the greatest baseball player that ever lived. And that's folks that know baseball. Very few people know the second greatest baseball player that ever lived. It wasn't Babe Ruth, he was the first. The second greatest baseball player that ever lived, his name is Ty Cobb. And Ty Cobb, they said in his baseball career, he had 4,191 hits. But you know, the greatest hit that he ever had was on his deathbed. People had witnessed to Ty Cobb. They had given the gospel to Ty Cobb. And he always kept saying later, we'll take care of that another day. I've got lots of time. 
And you know when he was finally on his deathbed, July 17th, 1961, with tears in his eyes, he invited the Lord Jesus Christ into his heart to become his Lord and to become his Savior. And just after he did that, his pastor was at his bedside. He said, I'd like you to tell my children how sorry I am that I did this in the last part of the ninth inning of my life. Instead of doing this in the first half of the first inning of my life. He said, I know I'm as saved now as I would have been if I got saved at the beginning of my life. But because I got saved so late in life, I have never been able to enjoy all the precious things for those that are in Christ. May I say to you, if you're saved this morning, there are some precious things for you to enjoy. If you're not saved, it's only in the days left before God takes you home that you still on this earth can enjoy them. Don't wait. If you're not saved, get saved. But if you are saved, enjoy what you have. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these opening four verses of this new study on 2 Peter. And Lord, as much as 1 Peter was to comfort those that were being persecuted for their faith, we are going to learn that 2 Peter is a warning. It's a warning to those that the devil is going to try to snare. And so Peter began this letter of 2 Peter, and he began by reminding us to uh, rejoice in things that are precious to every believer, our faith. Lord, for we that can say, I'm saved and on my way to heaven, we embrace a Christian faith that's precious. It ought to be true as Peter over those six years that we can rejoice in our growth. May God help us to grow in our Christian life. Third, we can enjoy and embrace God's grace. And it's nothing short of a miracle how we could face some of the things, the very things that this world comes apart when they hear. But Lord, you've given grace. You've given peace. Help us to rejoice in that. And then, Father, you talked here about great and precious promises. Lord, even for us that have been saved a long time, Things that we maybe by now have taken for granted. Heaven, sins forgiven, eternal security, an indwelling Holy Spirit, answered prayer, a home that waits in heaven. Lord, may we enjoy these precious promises. And Lord, if there's one not saved, listening to my voice, may they not put it off another day. May they not put it off another hour, but may they trust you as their Savior this day. With heads bowed and eyes closed in just a moment as the piano begins to play, God has given us so many things, if you're saved, that are precious. Have you taken them for granted? Have you assumed that they are, have always been yours and always will? Well, they haven't always been yours. They only began to be yours the moment that you got saved. Maybe this morning we simply need to rejoice in all these things that God has done for us. I pray you'd bless the invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with your heads bowed and eyes closed? And the piano is going to play an old song. He is so precious to me. Is he? Is he still precious to you? What he did at Calvary. Do you daily still thank him that he did that for you? You can see that over the years of being saved that you're growing. That you have grace. That God's given grace and he's given peace. That's precious. You know, if 
you've taken for granted some of those great promises. Maybe you need to remind yourself, maybe as a family, get together these next 24 hours and just rejoice in what this world knows nothing of. Why don't you thank God for all of these precious things that He's given. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the testimony of a man who the world thought so much of, Ty Cobb. Lord, the truth is it wasn't until his deathbed that he made the greatest decision of his life and trusted you as Savior. And Lord, he's just as saved as a little boy or a little girl who trust you as Savior. He just missed out his entire life enjoying these things that are so precious. Father, pray you'd help us amidst all of this world and we really don't know what's happening. What a blessing to have a Savior. What a blessing to grow in Christ. What a blessing to enjoy your grace and your peace. Lord, what a blessing to embrace these promises. I pray that you'd help us to rejoice in these things. Pray now, dismiss us. Take us to our homes. Give us rest this afternoon. Bring us back for prayer at 530 in service at 6, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you for coming.